It's sunlight that makes life on Earth possible. The sun, our star, just a giant ball of burning gas. How long could it have been there? It must have been making heat for millions of years. What process could possibly make so much energy for so long? Understanding the mechanism on how the sun produces photons explains how all is the sun. And this question is related to neutrinos. Albert Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared, showed that a tiny amount of mass could, in principle, be converted into a tremendous amount of energy. Physicists believe that the core of the sun acts like a nuclear fusion reactor. The main process is the proton-proton chain reaction, where hydrogen nuclei are fused to form helium, producing vast amounts of energy which balances the gravitational collapse of the star. However, the chain also contains other secondary processes, some very rare, which produce other particles and energy. These nuclear reactions are the only feasible way to continuously produce the amount of energy observed for billions of years. We can easily see and understand the light coming from the sun by observing the full spectrum of photons arriving at Earth, but they come from the surface and atmosphere of the star. How can we see inside the sun? How can we confirm the existence of fusion? Surprisingly, the answer comes in the form of a practically undetectable particle. When a nucleus decays, it emits energetic particles and becomes a more stable isotope. In the early 20th century, accurate measurements of the energy of beta decay products found that if only the nuclei and electron were involved, energy and momentum were lost in the decay. To reconcile this observation with the universal conservation of energy, Wolfgang Pauli, writing in 1930, felt obliged to invent a particle without mass or electric charge that could participate along with the nuclei and electron in the decay. Postulating a particle with little evidence for existence caused Pauli some worry. He said, I've done a terrible thing. I've postulated a particle that cannot be detected. This particle was later dubbed neutrino, or little neutral one, by Enrico Fermi in his theory of beta decay. Ten years later, Wang Gan Chang proposed that the neutrino could be detected in a rare process known as beta capture. In the same nuclear reaction at the core of the sun, neutrinos are emitted at a rate of one neutrino for every million photons. 90% of the neutrinos are released in the first proton-proton reaction. The most energetic neutrinos are produced in the so-called proton-proton-3 chain reactions, but are much less abundant as this reaction is far less probable accounting for only 0.11% of the energy produced in the sun. Photons take up to 500,000 years to get out of the sun, as they are constantly intercepted, absorbed, and re-emitted. But neutrinos, having no electric charge, travel in a straight line from the core of the sun. They come out at the speed of light as soon as they are created. Hypothetically, about 3% of the total energy radiated by the sun is in the form of neutrino. The flux of solar neutrinos at the Earth's surface is on the order of 60 billion per square centimeter per second. Unlike light, neutrinos travel through us, so about a trillion solar neutrinos pass through your thumb every second. Neutrinos are the most abundant particle in the universe after photons. 
But how can we see them? How can we detect something that is not affected by the electromagnetic force and has no mass? How can we see a particle that supposedly interacts with nothing? In 1962, John Bacall, a theoretical physicist from the California Institute of Technology, was introduced to Ray Davis Jr. by Willie Fowler, who was looking for a system to detect solar neutrinos. Ray Davis asked Bacall to calculate what amount of neutrinos the sun could produce and be captured by his detector. So Bacall calculated the neutrino capture rate in the current solar model by hand. In the early 1960s, John Bacall and Ray Davis started to consider how to verify how the sun shines. 1964 is the birth of neutrino astrophysics with a back-to-back -back paper by Ray Davis and John Bacall. The idea was to design a solar neutrino trap. Earth's surface is constantly being bombarded by many forms of radiation, like cosmic rays and solar particles. The detector had to be underground to prevent interference from these and other atmospheric particles. With this in mind, it was built inside the home state gold mine in Lead, South Dakota, at the depth of 1,478 meters. The detector was a huge 380 cubic meter tank filled with a common dry cleaning fluid, tetrachloroethylene, which was chosen because of the amount of chlorine in the compound. Upon collision with a neutrino, a chlorine atom transforms into a radioactive isotope of argon, which can be extracted and counted. It was necessary to use so much target material because there is a very small probability of a successful neutrino capture. Ray Davis designed a way to collect the argon that formed. Every few weeks, he bubbled helium through the tank to collect the radioactive argon. Counting the amount of atoms allowed him to determine how many nuclei had undergone the reaction induced by a neutrino so it was able to determine how many neutrinos had been captured. The Homestake experiment started to work in 1968, and it was an extraordinary success. For the first time, neutrinos from the sun were detected. But the first results observed that the sun's output of neutrinos was less than expected. In fact, only one-third of those expected from Bacall's calculations. This discrepancy between the number of predicted neutrinos and the number measured soon became known as the solar neutrino problem. The theoretical calculations were refined and checked many times over the next two decades by many scientists, but no significant errors were found in the model by John Bacall. The Homestick experiment continued to operate for decades, refining its measurements without any significant change in its observations. It was more than 20 years before the new detectors were designed to measure solar neutrinos, including lower energies, making them more sensitive. Galax was built inside the Gran Sasso Mountains in Italy using liquid gallium. Sage, also with gallium, in the Caucasus Mountains in Russia. Even earlier, Kamiokande followed by Super Kamiokande, both using ultra-pure water, were built near Kamioka in Japan, and unlike other detectors, were able to make real-time momentum measurements of the neutrino flux, confirming the sun as the dominant source. In all cases, the observed flux was between 50 and 60 percent of that predicted by the standard solar model. So their results still showed less neutrinos than original calculations. The consistency of measurements could only mean one of two things. The standard solar model was wrong, and its success in describing other aspects of the solar evolution was an accident, or there were other effects causing the flux of neutrinos from the sun to diminish before reaching Earth. This meant that a better theory of fundamental physics was required to solve the mystery of the missing neutrinos. In the early 2000, this new experiment 
that was able to measure electron neutrinos and also all the flavors of neutrinos, all the families of neutrinos, confirmed that the solution to the solar neutrino problem was that neutrinos change flavor. Neutrinos change type when they come from the sun to the earth. We also say that they change flavor. We don't know why, but neutrinos and all particles come in three families. On the way from the sun to the earth, neutrinos that were produced in one family, electron neutrinos, change to the other families, new or tau neutrinos. This is called neutrino oscillations, or neutrino flavor conversion. Ray Davis' experiment was only sensitive to electron neutrinos, and that's the reason why Ray Davis' experiment was measuring less neutrinos than the predicted by John Bacall calculations. The discovery derived by solving the solar neutrino problem is that neutrinos are massive. We don't know why neutrinos have different masses. It has taken more than 40 years to find the right amount of neutrinos coming from the sun. It has changed our description of the universe. Science is that, unexpected, full of big surprises. Light can give us a picture of the universe at night. We see photons coming from the stars, galaxies, far objects. Photons are the most abundant particles in the universe. But can we see what's going on inside stars? How can we get a glimpse of the unknown? Good news, an uncommon eye is opening up new frontiers. Why doing astronomy with neutrinos when they are so hard to detect? Well, the reason is simple. First of all, the neutrino has no electric charge, so it just is basically the same as a, a photon, the particle of light. So you are doing the same astronomy. The critical difference between neutrinos and light is neutrinos go through walls, light doesn't. And so the inference is that they may reach us from places in the universe that we have never seen before. So uh, we built Ice Cube to do astronomy with neutrinos. Now, the simplest way of thinking about astronomy is that you go out at night, you look at the sky, and you see beams of light coming from stars. This is the perfect analogy. Ice Cube is basically a big eye that looks at the sky, and instead of seeing beams of light, it sees beams of neutrinos. Now, why were we interested in neutrinos? Why not use light? It's cheaper and easier. Well, we are very likely to see very different things. And in fact, at the moment, we have detected our first beams and we are trying to figure out what we are actually seeing. But educated guesses are that we are seeing very powerful cosmic accelerators, maybe supernova remnants, gamma ray bursts, active galactic nuclei, all the things that are part of the high energy universe. What is so special about the South Pole? The South Pole ice itself is the detector. Between one and a half and two and a half kilometers below the surface, groups of light sensors are in position to see the light produced by particles passing through the ice. Over 5,160 of these light sensors have been deployed, instrumenting a volume of one square kilometer under the ice. High energy neutrinos produce a zoo of charged particles when they interact with the ice. These particles produce an explosion of light and Ice Cube captures it in its sensors. What's critical in the design is how far light travels through the ice. The light sensors have to be spaced according to the absorption length, the average distance light travels in the ice. In tap water, light will travel two meters. 
and distilled water, eight meters. In ice beneath the South Pole, light travels more than 100 meters, in some places even more than 200 meters. The ice in the South Pole is one of the clearest solids that exists. It may not be possible to build a solid in a laboratory as transparent as this ultra-pure ice, which, in the end, is just snow that condensed and fell on Antarctica about 100,000 years ago at the depth of Ice Cube. About two years ago, we were doing an, an analysis where we were looking for extremely high energy neutrinos. We actually knew exactly what we were looking for. We were looking for something that's called cosmogenic neutrinos. It doesn't matter what that is. We didn't find any. But when we looked at the data, we found something that we had never seen before. I remember when I was shown these events the first time, and you know, over the years, we have looked at thousands and thousands of events on the online display, and I knew I'd never seen events like those two. In fact, they were so special, we called them Bert and Ernie. After seeing them, it was clear what was special about these events, and we designed, designed a new analysis that go, could go and look for more of, the, of these. So by now, Bert and Ernie have 26 more friends, uh, which we recently published, claiming that we have evidence for neutrinos that uh, come from space. Where do they come from? That's our next frontier. And of course, everybody has already ideas. We know that some of them are not emitted in the direction of the, cent of the center or the plane of our own galaxy. So they come from outside the galaxy. There are hints in the data that some of them actually may come from our own galaxy. The problem is uh, there is not enough statistics, there are not enough events to come to a conclusion. So then we started busy uh, approaching a different direction. We started to look for more events. And uh, so I think I'm afraid you will have to stay tuned, but eventually we'll figure it out. What's next? Well, clearly finding more of these very special events. By the way, what's special about these events is that they have enormous energies. That's why they look different from anything I had seen before. Uh, we detect a neutrino every six minutes, but they are rather uninteresting and produced in our Earth's atmosphere. These events have 10 times bigger energy. So clearly we want to get more of these and so what you do is you build a bigger detector. And we are now figuring out how to do that. And it turns out it's not that difficult because uh, we found out while building Ice Cube that uh, the South Pole ice is much more clearer than we had guessed. And so this allows us to make, build a much bigger detector by basically doubling the number of sensors that we have to deploy in the ice. So we are busily designing our next step. Matter is what makes our world. It's all around us. Matter is our universe. But why matter? What makes it more special than any other forms of energy? Trillions of particles pass through us every second. One of them is so faint that it is extremely hard to detect. Could it be the answer to this question? How could we find out? How can you find a grain of salt on a beach? There are three types of beta decay. Standard beta decay involves the nucleus decaying by emitting an electron and a neutrino. The second is double beta decay, where two electrons and two neutrinos are emitted simultaneously. Very few nuclei can undergo this decay, since it requires that the isotope 1 beta decay from the original be more unstable, making this simpler decay even more unlikely. 
The nuclei for which this decay has been observed are extremely stable with lifetimes greater than the age of the universe. A third, as yet unobserved channel is neutrinoless double beta decay. For this decay to exist, the neutrinos must annihilate each other, a process which requires the neutrino to be its own antiparticle and hence a distant type of matter to all other particles. Double beta decay is a very rare uh, decay process. So in some sense, it's very strange, but it has nothing special. It happens in a number of nuclei. What is very relevant is when this decay is produced without the emission of neutrinos. Why is that so? Because it marks the existence of a very peculiar property of the neutrino, the fact that the neutrino is its own antiparticle. The neutrinos are the neutrinos in the standard model are supposed to be two different particles. If uh, this process happens, uh, neutrinos and antineutrinos are the same particle because the nucleus that decay, the neutrino exists inside the nucleus, it is an exchange between two parts of the nucleus uh, to make uh, possible this decay. This decay was foreseen by Majorana in 1938 already. Neutrino would be, in this case, also also antineutrino, that is like matter to be also anti talking to antimatter. And that in the universe you have only practically matter. So that might be an explanation why matter is so dominating in the universe. We wanted to be able to make an experiment that could display a large mass and with very clean signal. And there were a number of ideas around, but eventually it came out of a discussion with Dave Nygren, a professor from Berkeley, who had the idea since a long time of using semen. So we started to discuss, we came up with the idea we could build this chamber for the Confran experiment, and so next idea was born. Next is a simple idea, is a pressure chamber. Basically, it's a pot at high pressure in which uh, you feel a lot of semen. Xenon is a gas that has the capability of scintillating, producing ultraviolet light. We are able to use this ultraviolet light to give us the signals that we will use to detect the eventual disintegration of a particle. So one next great idea is, is the fact that the same gas that we use as a target because it can decay as a double beta is the very same detector that will tell us that the decay has happened. Next is contained within a pressure vessel made of a low radioactivity titanium steel alloy. Xenon gas is continuously purified and flowed through the vessel. The central part of the vessel contains a system to produce a directed electric field, the field cage. The field causes electrons liberated from their atoms by passing charged particles to move towards the amplification region. A plane of sensors at the opposite end of the vessel measures the deposited energy, while another, more finely instrumented and directly behind the amplification region, records the event topology. An array of large, high-sensitivity photomultipliers accurately records the amount of light produced allowing for a reconstruction of the energy deposited in the gas. In the other plane, an array of small, closely packed silicon photomultipliers are tasked with recording information about where the light was produced. In a neutrinoless double beta decay of xenon 136, two electrons of a fixed energy are emitted. So what we would expect to detect in next, if a double beta decay happens, uh, is to measure an event with the right energy, 2.5 MeV, and that it looks like two electrons coming from a common point. This, with the detector, we would take a picture of this event, and it would look like, like a long track with two blobs at the end. The next team designed a matrix of thousands of silicon photomultipliers that allows the scientists to make a picture of the electron trajectory. The sensors are on a strip of flexible kapton that avoids the introduction of radioactivity inside the detector. It is very difficult to design and build radio-pure electronics that have no interference with the detection signal. 
The electronics of the photomultipliers widen the signal so it can be reconstructed later point by point. The electronics of the silicon photomultipliers integrates the signal every microsecond so it can make a million images per second. The electrons that are produced in the ionization of the xenon gas by charged particles excite the xenon atoms which decay emitting VUV light near 172 nanometers. The silicon photomultipliers are not sensitive at this short wavelength. We have therefore to use an organic wavelength shifter called TPB to shift the VUV light into blue light to which the silicon PMs are most sensitive. We do this process by vacuum evaporation in a clean room at ICMOL, the Instituto de Ciencia Molecular. The vacuum evaporation of TPB allows us to obtain very clean and uniform coatings on the silicon PMs, which make them able to record the xenoscintillation light and perform the tracking function in the TPC. We're being bombarded constantly by particles. How can we get a clean signal when we're surrounded by such din? How can we see a glint through the glare? The Canfranc Laboratory was first conceived by Angel Morales and other researchers at the University of Zaragoza in 1985. This first proposal to build experimental areas inside the old train tunnel under the Pyrenees was dismissed, but later a larger facility was built. Placing detectors for rare events underground shields them from much of the radiation coming from the sun and atmosphere, stopping the interesting signals from being overwhelmed, much like the light from distant stars can be overwhelmed by the light from the sun or moon. Next, we'll search for neutrinoless double beta decay in the Canfranc Laboratory. Why are we here? We know that the universe is made of matter and not of antimatter. We also know that the early universe should have been made up of equal parts matter and antimatter. But where did all the antimatter go? Could this ghost of a particle hold the key? Could a Majorana neutrino cause the universe to favor matter? The implication of a neutrino that is its own antiparticle could be the reason why we are here to ask the question. The reason why NEXT is important and we think that it may have a great future for science is that discovery that the neutrino is its own antiparticle may take a great effort. It may require to have masses of up to one ton of xenon. No other experiment is capable, we think, of deploying at the same time the great energy resolution the good topological signal and the large mass that we can deploy next. Therefore, we do think that as the problem of discovering the neutrino as its own antiparticle becomes more and more difficult, NEXT has more and more chances of being the discovery experiment. An interesting question is why do we do this kind of science? Why do we search for these rare events? And how do we know that we're going to succeed? The answer, as a matter of fact, is that we don't know that we are willing to take the risks. It's very interesting to compare what we are trying to do in NEXT, searching for neutrino less double beta decay experiments, with the recent success of the Ice Cube experiment run by Francis Halson. What Halson has told us is that when they proposed the experiments, they gave a number of arguments. None of those arguments were exactly true. None of those arguments were perfectly convincing. And as a matter of fact, all the original ideas about the detector were good, but not exactly as good as you could imagine. But at the end, things work. At the end, you put the faith, the passion, the years of work, and you end up discovering something that you didn't even expect. I think that what science is all about is not finding what you expect to find. It's to find something you didn't have any idea you were going to find. It's to find the unexpected.